Hello and welcome to the Philosophy of Science lecture slideshow for week 9. These slides cover the ninth week of the course. For this set, be sure to read handouts 3, 3A through 3D, and Okasha chapter 2. Explore also the links to additional content within Canvas. This is part two of two lectures on how does scientific reasoning work? I've been discussing some trends in the history of science. We're going now to focus on logical empiricism or positivism and post-positivism. Here are the big questions motivating it. Here are the big questions motivating us. How do we acquire knowledge of the unobserved? How do we justify induction? Review handout 3C in Canvas on Hume's problem of induction. Also see in particular pages 24 through 28 in the Okasha text. You should be able to answer the following questions after this section of the module. Why exactly does David Hume believe that induction cannot be rationally justified? In your own words, state the exact problem with inferring that any predictions or generalizations are true. Why can't the principle of induction be justified empirically, or a priori, independently of experience? If the principle of induction cannot be proven, does that mean we can't trust the findings of science? Why, or why not? A little review here. This is what most arguments in science presume. In blue, I have two assumptions. One frequently used in statistical reasoning, the other in causal reasoning, although both can occur. They are never explicitly stated, but they are presumed. If a sample accurately represents the population from which it is drawn, then probably whatever is a property of that sample is also a property of the population. If there is a strong correlation between X and Y, and X and Y don't accidentally coincide, then probably X is a cause of Y. Causal reasoning requires this assumption. It presumes it. The issue is whether we have a good reason to accept either assumption. Each of these is based upon believing, in general, that past observations justify beliefs about future observations. Now, why should we accept this? Call this the assumption that nature is uniform or that the future resembles the past. David Hume questions it. So this is going to be what we call the problem of induction. Scientific reasoning presumes what it cannot prove. This is David Hume in 1748. If we be, therefore, engaged by arguments to put trust in past experience and make it the standard of our future judgment, these arguments must be probable only. We have said that all arguments concerning existence are founded on the relation of cause and effect, that our knowledge of that relation is derived entirely from experience, and that all our experimental conclusions proceed upon the supposition that the future will be conformable to the past. To endeavor, therefore, the proof of this last supposition by probable arguments, or arguments regarding existence, must be evidently going in a circle and taking that for granted, which is the very point in question. I'm going to unpack his argument, but first let's look at this assumption, namely the assumption that nature is uniform. It's called the principle of the uniformity of nature, or the uniformity of nature principle. It has many forms, but it boils down to basically the idea that the future will be like the past. Unobserved cases of a phenomenon will resemble observed cases. Objects we have not examined will be similar in relevant respects to objects of the same sort we have examined. But what justifies accepting this principle? Observations? Reason? Wishful thinking? Consider the following allegedly strong inductive argument. We have observed numerous emeralds, and each has been green. Therefore, all emeralds are green. Notice I'm generalizing from our observations. We're summarizing, saying that the thing about emeralds is that they're green based on those observations. Here's another argument like that. 
we have observed numerous emeralds and each has been green. Therefore, the next emerald we observe will be green. So that conclusion is a prediction. Notice predictions and generalizations are presuming that observations of similar cases in the past are going to be sufficient evidence, are going to justify our conclusions about what we expect to see in the future, about what we expect to believe in general, about emeralds. The thing about emeralds is that they're green. Here's why we think it. However, there are emeralds which are not green. They're called scarlet emeralds. Big spite. Notice how the arguments fail. In other words, we can't conclude all emeralds are green or that the next emerald we observe will be green just because all previous observed emeralds were green. Attempts to prove the principle that nature is uniform fail. Now let me show you why. This is Hume's argument. I'll get to the details of his argument when I break it down into a standard argument form. We can say two things about knowledge. Knowledge can be a posteriori or a priori. What's that mean? A posteriori knowledge, or a proof, based on a posteriori knowledge, is a proof based on experience. A posteriori means after experience. Induction typically uses such proofs, namely, nature has been uniform in past observations, and by that I mean predictable, uh, behaves regularly. Therefore, nature in general is, is uniform. The sun has risen every time we've looked. And so we don't think it's crazy to believe that in the future it's going to rise as well. Now, an a priori proof is different. This is one based purely on reason prior to experience, independent of experience. This is, would be, say, a reason-based argument. The claim, the future resembles the past, can't be false. Right? It's a contradiction to say that future observations will be different than past observations. Now, if that's the case, the future will resemble the past. And, and in each case, notice what we're doing is we're really trying to justify believing that we can use past observations to say something about the future or something in general. However, each of these assumptions, especially claims one and claims three, each of these assumptions is themselves based upon already assuming that the thing about nature is that it's uniform or predictable, that the future will resemble the past. This is called reasoning in a circle. Here's Hume's argument on this. Let's start with the conclusion. Hume concludes because he cannot come up with an a priori argument or an a posteriori argument for believing that the future resembles the past, he concludes that there is going to be no rational justification for those beliefs we express in predictions or generalizations. And he's talking now in particular about conclusions of inductive arguments. Again, inductive arguments are those arguments whose conclusions never necessarily follow, but they follow with probability. They're likely to the extent that past observations resemble future observations. And what we're, what we're wondering about here is whether we can trust what we've observed in the past to be adequate, to be enough to justify believing what we see in the future or in general. Let's begin with the argument here. Every inductive argument assumes something like the future resembles the past, some version of that. Number two, if the conclusion of an inductive argument is rationally justified by the premises, then those premises themselves need to be rationally justifiable. Three, if the conclusion of an inductive argument is justified, and there needs to be either a good inductive argument or a good deductive argument for the principle that nature is uniform. But, number four, there is no good inductive argument for the principle that nature is uniform since any such argument will be circular. That is, it presumes in advance what it is intended to prove. How are we going to show that nature is uniform just because it has been uniform in the past. That's like saying, just because someone has told you the truth in the past, that they're going to tell you the truth in the future. We have many versions of this. 
There also, number five, there also cannot be a good deductive argument for the principle that nature is uniform. Again, a deductive argument would be one where the conclusion is necessary. How could I be justified believing that the principle that nature is uniform is necessarily true? Well, it would be necessarily true if there's no way it could be false. But the principle that nature is uniform is not a priori true. We don't know it by reason alone. We don't have a good reason to just think it's true. I mean, it's not obviously true. It's not self-evident or axiomatic. That is, we can imagine that nature is sometimes not uniform. And if it's sometimes not uniform predictable, then we can't just conclude in any particular case that it is uniform or that we should expect it to be uniform. Exceptions undermine the rule. So the principle that nature is uniform does not deductively follow from observations we have made thus far. Number six, the principle that nature is uniform isn't rationally justified. Seven, so, conclu so Hume concludes, there's no rational justification for those beliefs we express in predictions or generalizations. Now, Hume is making a philosophical point. There's practical value in doing this, but we lose certainty. We are vulnerable to presuming that the future will resemble the past and being wrong. And what he means philosophically is that we don't have a good deductive argument or an inductive argument for that major assumption, that required assumption we need whenever we make an argument for the conclusion that the future will resemble the past. Going back here, quick review. Take a closer look at this. Claim 1 and conclusion 2. Therefore, nature in general is uniform. Again, why do I think nature is uniform? Because it has been. Is that a good enough reason to believe nature will remain uniform? Is that, is that a good enough reason to believe that whenever we make a prediction, we are justified making a prediction based on what we observed in the past? Predictions often turn out to be false. A priori. Here's another way, number four, another way to justify deductively the future resembles the past. Well, the future would resemble the past if it were a contradiction to say that the future resembles the past. But we understand that sometimes the future doesn't, so that falls apart. So that's Hume's argument. The problem then is this, this sort of circular reasoning or presuming what you need to prove. This can never justify a conclusion. The premise is based already on accepting the conclusion that future observations resemble past observations. But can't we just sharpen definitions to preserve the generalization? I mean, isn't it just true if you look in the dictionary that emeralds, all emeralds are green? That's the thing about emeralds? Well, you have to ask yourself, how did that definition get in there? How did that description come to be acceptable? It's acceptable because the reason people believe emeralds are green is that all the emeralds they've seen are, are green. However, now we are aware of emeralds that aren't green. So what do we do? The dictionary catalogs the ways the term is used. Emeralds typically, often, are green, and yet sometimes they're not. So the definition is not going to do it. The definition is downstream from our reasoning about the thing about emeralds is that they're green. Right? We can sharpen definitions, but then we are using deduction, not induction. If we just say necessarily that's the thing about emeralds, that they're green, we've cheated. We haven't really justified thinking based on past observations. We've just sort of stipulated that's the thing about emeralds. And the issue here is whether we can trust induction. You know, one more example from biology. Farmers, bird washers, ornithologists have observed numerous ravens, and each has been black. I mean, think about the ravens you've seen. They're all black. So you draw the conclusion, naturally, that all ravens are black. But again, you've only seen some. And maybe all the ones you've seen, all the ones any humans has ever seen, is black. That doesn't mean that they're all going to be black. There are these future ravens. There are ravens in the past. And it turns out there are actually ravens. This is a kind of natural variation. There are actually ravens that are white albinos. These live uh, on Vancouver Island off of Canada. So even though farmers, bird watchers, ornithologists have observed numerous ravens and each has been black, we can't conclude, probably, that the next raven we observe will be black. 
typical response to this argument is, well, those are not real ravens. Those are white corvids. Real ravens are black corvids, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's another bird, another kind of bird. Well, it turns out, actually, they have the exact same genetic constitution. The white birds are the offspring of the black birds. They're examples of the very same species, Corvus corax. Here is Hume's point. We have no guarantee that nature is uniform. We think it. It's useful to make predictions and generalizations based on it. But we have no philosophical reason to suppose that the future will be like the past. Any justification for thinking this is pragmatic, not rational. We can't prove inductively any matters of empirical fact. Any matters... There are attempts to resolve the problem of induction, and I think all of them fail, but let's talk about a few of them. Some general non-solutions to the problem of induction. Number one, we can ignore the problem, use it anyway, but accept that sometimes we are going to have justified false beliefs. But how then does induction ever yield knowledge? And by justified false belief, I mean like that one about ravens. You wouldn't fault a person for believing that when they see a bird that's white among ravens, that it's probably not a raven because all their experience supports that claim. All their experience has confirmed that belief. It support, it, it, it's consistent with it. The issue, of course, is that our experience is limited. There are lots of ravens, lots of natural variation. Second, we could demote induction or drop it in favor of falsificationism. I'll talk about this. This is the idea that, idea that science progresses more by making risky predictions and severe tests of hypotheses. We never prove anything. At best, what we do is disprove a claim. This method, this method will have severe limits. We can't demonstrate that an empirical hypothesis is true, only that it's false. The logical method of science, then, on this view, is bold conjectures and decisive reputations. More on this when we discuss positivism. The third strategy here, given the problem of induction, is to adopt a modified inductivism. That is, use sophisticated probabilistic induction to draw conclusions, but accept that they are inherently uncertain. For example, interpret probability as a reasonable expectation based on prior knowledge or a measurement of personal belief. Bayesians, for instance, estimate the mathematical probability of a hypothesis A, given prior beliefs or alleged facts B. Such attempts evade Hume's problem, but offers a workaround. We use experience to guide expectations and behavior, even if we can't justify it based on induction. The Bayesian mathematical model is too complex to go into detail here. It's beyond the scope of this course. However, I recommend you take a course in inductive logic. It's extremely important to see how scientists today actually use probabilistic reasoning, even though the math is hard. You don't need to do the math yourself, but you need to see that such reasoning is the closest we can come to practically justifying conclusions based on prior learning and observations without being absolutely sure of our answers. Watch the following healthcare triage video to get an idea about how it is used in medical settings and diagnostic tests, such as mammograms. It's called the Bayes' Theorem. What are the odds? Here's a quote from that. The average woman who has a positive mammogram, their x-ray scan looks like cancer, has a 4% chance of having breast cancer. This means there is a 96% chance she does not actually have cancer. So a positive scan does not mean you have cancer. You might, but probably you don't, based on prior cases and observations. Odds will change depending upon other prior conditions. For example, a lump, family history, other risk factors. Nevertheless, inductive inference is limited. The turkey found that on his first morning at the turkey farm, he was fed at 9 a.m. Being a good inductivist turkey, he did not jump to conclusions. He waited until he collected a large number of observations that he was fed at 9 a.m. and made these observations under a wide range of circumstances on Wednesdays, on Thursdays, on cold days, on warm days. Each day, he added another observation statement to his list. Finally, he was satisfied that he had collected a number of observation statements to inductively infer that I am always fed at 9 a.m. However, on the morning of Christmas Eve, he was not fed, but instead had his throat cut. This example is from Bertrand Russell, 1912. 
Bottom line, induction is unreliable. Nevertheless, we rely on it. The question we've been exploring answers to is, in general, this one. What is the difference between science and non-science? And positivists are going to give us an answer, or what they're going to give us is some essential criteria of scientific reasoning. The answer is testables. Now, you should be able to answer the following question after this section of the module. What exactly is the difference between a hypothesis being falsifiable and its being verifiable? These are both forms of testability. Consider positivists. Alfred Ayer and Karl Popper on what makes a hypothesis scientific. Define verifiable and falsifiable precisely and produce clear examples illustrating the difference between the concepts. One thing here, we never want to define a term by using the term itself. We want to describe it in a way that tells a person what it means without just repeating the word. For instance, I could say, and it would be true to say, that verifiable claims are verifiable. Verifiable claims are able to be verified. I don't know what you mean by verify. What you've got to do is say what it means to verify. You can't just say verifiable claims are able to be, ver be verified. Same goes for the term falsifiable. A claim is falsifiable if it's, if it's able to be falsified. What does that mean? You're not telling me what it means to make a claim falsified. Okay, look at, let's look at trend four, logical empiricism or positivism. Those words we can use interchangeably, although historically they one morphed into the other. This is in general the idea that the best or only source of knowledge is the mathematical and logical analysis of sensory experience. So notice they're adding everything in here, deduct deduction, induction, and empiricism. Claims about what cannot be observed, or assertions which cannot be confirmed or disconfirmed by observation or logic, are going to be either meaningless or analytic, true in virtue of the meanings of their terms. Logical empiricism positivism is the idea that scientific knowledge is a product of observation plus deduction or induction. Now, given the problem of induction, we realize that observing and reasoning alone don't produce conclusive evidence or decisive proofs of hypotheses. Scientific inquiry consists in formulating hypotheses, deriving their implications, and testing them with experiments. A false prediction should force you to reject or revise any hypothesis. So how does this work? Here's an example of the reasoning in an argument form. If the measles, mumps, rubella vaccines cause autism, then the incidence of autism in vaccinated kids is greater than those vaccinated. What I have in boldface, MMR vaccines cause autism, that's your hypothesis, and it's predicting that you will observe a higher rate of autism in vaccinated kids than those not vaccinated. Claim two, autism cases among vaccinated kids is not greater than non-vaccinated. So in what we've done here, claim two actually negates the second part of the first claim, in which case we have to conclude, and this is Modus Tollens deductive reasoning, we have to conclude that it is false that MMR vaccines cause autism. If MMR vaccines cause autism, we expect to see a difference we expect to see more autism in vaccinated kids, but we don't. So we can't conclude, that is, we should conclude that it's false, that MMR vaccines cause autism. That's how the reasoning works. Here are some terms you're going to come across. I'm going to define them for you here, and then we're going to move on. You'll see the phrase, the syntactic model of theories. That's a fancy way of saying that scientific theories are collections of propositions. And that what they do is describe or explain phenomena. They describe or explain what's happening, appearances. Another turn of phrase, the inferential model of explanation. This is the idea that scientific theories explain events, yes, because they are either valid deductive or strong inductive arguments. So this is the idea that an explanation is a kind of argument. This is what positivists thought. This view is not widely accepted anymore. Finally, there's this ugly turn of phrase, the hypothetical deductive method of theory justification. All this is saying is that scientific theories function or should as logical arguments do. They should function as justifications. They should function as explanations. And in fact, that is the view we all hold now. So scientific knowledge progresses by inferring truths from empirical claims, that is, deriving them 
logically from observations. Again, the syntactic view of theory says a theory is a set of claims from which particular inferences can be logically derived. You've got general claims that express laws of nature. These are universal. They're, they're true everywhere, always allegedly. Or they are statistical generalizations, which you can derive from observations. Specific claims describe circumstances, call these alleged facts, and then there's this conclusion, which is a description of the event you want to explain. All of this is called the hypothetical deductive method of theory justification. Because it, sa it says scientific theories look ideally like deductive arguments. And again, arguments are great because they justify their conclusions about hypotheses given certain facts and principles and natural laws and definitions. But all this raises the question, what is a theory? So I'm going to give you a description. A theory has three essential attributes. Now, this is not the perfect definition of a theory, but this is what makes a theory different than, say, a hypothesis or a claim. A theory describes reality. It's supposed to. It explains things, events. It's supposed to justify beliefs about those events, beliefs about what explains them. Theories aren't facts. It's a mistake when people say that. Theories are not opinions. They're more sophisticated than that. Theories aren't laws of nature. Theories contain all of these. They refer to these. They draw conclusions from these. But each of these must be accompanied by justification. For example, a couple theories here, two rival theories. And again, theories want to explain what we observe. So here are two rival explanations of climate change. Presume it's real. Obviously, people, some people doubt it. But let's assume it's real. Okay, what explains it? We need to consider alternative explanations. One is that it's humans. That is, humans have a major role. That's called the anthropogenic theory. Anthropogenic causes of climate change will be greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, oxides of nitrogen, fluorocarbons, sulfates, nitrates pumped into our atmosphere by human activity. Or, rival theory, non-anthropogenic causes volcanic eruptions, ocean currents, Earth's orbital changes, and solar variations. If you look at this chart here, you can see what they're talking about. They're talking about an increase, uh, uh, an, an absolutely small but relatively large and dramatic increase in temperature. Look, if 97% of engineers agree the bridge ahead is going to collapse, and 3% say not to worry, would you keep driving? Should we trust experts on climate change? Estimates from published literature and expert surveys show striking agreement among climate scientists on the basics of anthropogenic climate change. But the American public expresses substantial doubt. So what does this all tell us? There's this controversy. Well, the controversy among scientists is actually insignificant. It's not really worth teaching or spending too much time on to present both sides of anthropogenic climate change versus non-anthropogenic is going to be misleading and it's going to undermine education and research efforts, research credibility, and distracts people from solutions and more important issues. I mean, when claims fail expert peer review, we've got a pretty good reason to doubt them. I mean, this is what real disagreement in the scientific community looks like. We've got four agencies and if you look at that line, that average is pretty much, they're all agreeing. Okay, let's have a specific look at logical empiricists, positivists. Logical empiricists realize that scientists can never achieve the sort of certainty we find in mathematics. Nevertheless, scientific reasoning could emulate mathematical deduction. The most distinctive characteristic which differentiates mathematics from the various branches of empirical science, and, w and which accounts for its fame as the queen of the sciences, is no doubt the peculiar certainty and necessity of its results. This is Carl Hempel. The propositions of mathematics have, therefore, the same unquestionable certainty, which is typical of such propositions as all bachelors are unmarried. But they also share the complete lack of empirical content, which is associated with that certainty. The propositions of mathematics are devoid of all factual content. They convey no information whatever on any empirical subject matter. This is Carl Hempel on the nature of mathematical truth. What he means by this, claims such as all bachelors are unmarried or 2 plus 2 equals 4, what he means by this is that it's not telling us uh, anything new. It's based purely on the concept of 
what a bachelor is. A bachelor is an unmarried adult male human. So it's going to follow logically, deductively, that if you have a bachelor, you've got an unmarried human. 2 plus 2 equals 4. That's mathematical deduction. That's just not based on experience, not summarizing, generalizing, predicting from observations, which we want to be able to do in science. Here is ample summary of what doing science requires. Scientific method consists in, one, inventing hypotheses. This is the creative part. Two, deriving testable implications, right? Each hypothesis implies, predicts that you observe something in particular. And then you test them. You would reject the hypothesis if it predicted something you don't see, but you should see. Here's Carl Hempel again on this. Produce a hypothesis H to explain some phenomenon. If H is true, then it implies a specific observation. If experiments show the test implication to be false, the hypothesis is rejected. But if the implication is true, then the hypothesis continues on to further tests. He gives the case of Ignaz Semmelweis, the Hungarian physician, and his work on childbed fever. Here is Hungarian physician Ignaz Semmelweis. Childbed fever, or the doctor's plague, was an infection contracted by women during childbirth or miscarriage, usually at the site of the placenta, and it could lead to death. Semmelweis tested various hypotheses, and from his research, such an infection is now known to be caused by a bacterium. He didn't know anything about bacteria. He found that infection is preventable by washing one's hands between cadaver patient visits. This is the person from whom we get the idea of disinfecting our hands before treating patients. Hempel uses Semmelweis and his research as an example of his hypothetico-deductive method. Doctors were alarmed by a striking divergence in the rates of women's death after childbirth in two maternity wards of the Vienna General Hospital in the 1840s. I'm going to read a description of Semmelweis's work from the excerpt that I gave you on Hempel. This is going to be handout from handout 3b under the heading Scientific Inquiry, Invention, and Test. Semmelweis began by considering various explanations that were current at the time to explain the disparity in the deaths of one ward versus the other. Some of these he rejected out of hand as incompatible with well-established facts. Others he subjected to specific tests. One widely accepted view attributed the ravages of puerperal fever, childbed fever, to epidemic influences, which were vaguely described as atmospheric, cosmic, telluric changes, spreading over whole districts and causing childbed fever in women in confinement. But how, Semmelweis reasons, could such influences have plagued the first division, the first ward, for years, and yet spared the second ward? And how could this view be reconciled with the fact that while the fever was raging in the hospital, hardly a case occurred in the city of Vienna or in its surroundings? A genuine epidemic, such as cholera, would not be so selective. Finally, Semmelweis noted that some of the women admitted to the first ward living far from the hospital had been overcome by labor on their way and had given birth in the street. Yet, despite these adverse conditions, the death rate from childbed fever among these cases of street birth was lower than the average for the first division. There's something about that first ward. On another view, overcrowding was a cause of mortality in the first division, but Semmelweis points out that, in fact, the crowding was heavier in the second ward, partly as a result of the desperate efforts of patients to avoid assignment to the notorious first division, where people were dying at a rate of four to five times as much. Various psychological explanations were attempted as well, one of them noted that the first ward was so arranged that a priest bearing the last sacrament to a dying woman passed through five wards before reaching the sick room beyond. The appearance of the priest preceded by an attendant ringing a bell announcing the presence of the priest was held to have a terrifying and debilitating effect upon the patients in the wards and thus to make them more likely victims of childbed fever. In the second ward, this adverse factor was absent, since the priest 
had direct access to the sick room. Semmelweis decided to check this conjecture. He persuaded the priest to come by a roundabout route and without ringing of the bell, in order to reach the sick chamber silently and unobserved. But the mortality in the first division did not decrease, so it wasn't the priest's. At last, early in 1847, an accident gave Semmelweis the decisive clue for his solution of the problem. A colleague of his, Kolechka, received a puncture wound in the finger from the scalpel of a student with whom he was performing an autopsy and died after an agonizing illness during which he displayed the same symptoms that Semmelweis had observed in the victims of childbed fever, although the role of microorganisms in such infections had not yet been recognized at the time. Semmelweis realized that cadaveric matter which the student's scalpel had introduced into Kolechka's bloodstream had caused his colleague's fatal illness. And the similarities between the course of Kolechka's disease and that of the women in his clinic led Semmelweis to the conclusion that his patients had died of the same kind of blood poisoning. He, his colleagues, and the medical students had been the carriers of the infectious material, for he and his associates used to come to the wards directly from performing dissections of bodies in the autopsy room, and then examine the women in labor after only superficially washing their hands which often retained a characteristic foul odor. Again, Semmelweis put his idea to a test. He reasoned that if he were right, then childbed fever could be prevented by chemically destroying the infectious material adhering to the hands. He therefore issued an order requiring all medical students to wash their hands in a solution of chlorinated lime before making an examination. The mortality from childbed fever promptly began to decrease, and for the year 1848 it fell to 1.27% in the first division, compared to 1.3 in the second. Here is a screenshot of the relevant section of handout 3D showing the logic of Semmelweis's reasoning about the probable causes of childbed fever. Summarizing, how exactly does scientific reasoning work? For positivists, the answer is that science frames and tests hypotheses that are subject to disproof. What is testability? A hypothesis is an assertion or an assumption. It may be true or false. For any empirical hypothesis, if it is scientific, then it's testable. Observations must enable us to support or reject any hypothesis. If a hypothesis isn't testable, it's not scientific. So what exactly does testable mean? Let's compare and contrast Alfred Ayer and Karl Popper on testability. To say that a claim or hypothesis is testable is to say either that it is verifiable or falsifiable, or both. According to Ayer, scientific claims are empirically verifiable. That is, their truth can be established through observations. Karl Popper thought that scientific claims are empirically falsifiable. This is their distinguishing trait. That is, their truth should be incompatible with some observations. Let's focus on Ayer's form of logical positivism first. It was called verificationism. It's the idea that for any statement to be meaningful, it must be possible to conform or corroborate, support it through experience observations. Here's the verificationist principle. All meaningful sentences are either analytic that is true or false in virtue of the meanings of its terms, for example, logical or mathematical claims, or verifiable. So claims are either analytic, true by definition, or verifiable by experience. Scientific claims are going to be empirically verifiable. Here is Ayer's argument. All meaningful claims are either analytic or empirically verifiable. Metaphysical, religious, ethical, aesthetic claims are neither tautologies, true by definition, nor empirically verifiable. Therefore, metaphysical, religious, ethical, and aesthetic claims are not meaningful. In the excerpt I gave you from Alfred Ayer, he has some terms I want to say something about. To say that a claim is factually significant is to say that We can think of observations which would lead you to accept or reject it. So if someone says there are mountains on the far side of the moon, well, we could travel there and look at that side of the moon we don't ordinarily see. We could send a satellite out there to look at that side of the moon, and we could get pictures. We could verify whether or not there are mountains on that side of the moon. 
verifiable in principle would mean, for instance, we are as yet unable to do it, but we can imagine how to do it. Practically verifiable, strongly verifiable, weakly verifiable. These are all other degrees of verifiability depending upon how much you can actually access and experience which would cause you to accept or reject the claim. Non-scientific claims such as religious, ethical, and metaphysical claims are no more testable or meaningful than those found in literary fiction, Ayer says. Here are a few examples to illustrate what he means by that. Suppose someone says there are no extra pieces in the universe. Everyone is here because he or she has a place to fill, and every piece must fit itself into the big jigsaw puzzle. What experience would show that that's true? What experience would confirm that? Unicorns can only be tamed by a virgin woman. Well, issue here is that while you might be able to get hold of a virgin, a virgin woman, unicorns are elusive, perhaps even fictional. We can't test this claim. We can't get unicorns and then see whether or not they can be tamed by a virgin. Here's another one. An invisible, supernatural, all-powerful, all-knowing, all-good, intelligent designer made the world. This comes, of course, from Jewish, Christian, Muslim religions. Let's put to one side that it would be difficult to observe something invisible. In general, it's difficult, perhaps impossible, to observe something supernatural if we are ourselves confined to nature. But forget about that. We're talking here about the world's origin. No one was there. We can't go there. Certainly what we see is consistent with the story that an all-powerful, all-knowing, all-good, intelligent designer made it. But it's also consistent with there having been no such being. So the issue here is that the claim is just not testable by observations. And thus, it's not a scientific claim, according to positivists. A couple of other claims. Religious claims are not alone in being vulnerable to this criticism. Everything is made of matter. Whatever exists is physical. We would have to look at everything and establish that it's made of matter, that it's physical. Can't do it. Not testable. Every event has a cause. Certainly it's true we believe that whatever happens, happens for a reason, or that whatever occurs was caused to occur by something prior. But in fact, we haven't seen the origins of everything. In fact, there might be things that occur that are uncaused. In fact, in physics, spontaneous events occur. Uncaused events allegedly occur, such as radioactive decay or random genetic mutations. Everything happens for a reason except when it doesn't, but even then you can, in hindsight, fabricate a reason that will satisfy your belief system. But Ayer's argument has a huge problem. It depends upon his verificationist principle, which itself is not verifiable by experience. It's not necessarily true. It's not analytic. To say it's analytic or necessarily true is to say it can't be false. But we can perhaps imagine meaningful claims that are not analytic or empirically verifiable. He hasn't shown that there are none, just that it, they're not testable by observations. The verificationist principle can't be verified. It could be false. So it's not true analytically, and there is no good deductive argument for it. No observation supported, and it seems that many claims are meaningful but not verifiable. Either way, it violates its own requirements. Still, it's a good idea that science at least require that theories rely upon as few unverifiable claims as possible. This kind of testability is a minimal requirement. It also helps us draw a line between science and non-science. Scientific claims should be verifiable, but this is not enough. So what exactly is testability? Logical empiricists, positivists, have an answer. Science requires that one's methods of observation be transparent, and one's hypotheses be testable. David Hume showed that it is not possible to logically derive a hypothesis from observations. But this does not affect the possibility of refuting a hypothesis by observations or observation statements. Here's Karl Popper. In science, we are always concerned with explanations, predictions, and tests, and that the method of testing hypotheses is always the same. Conjectures boldly put forward for trial. The result of tests is the selection of hypotheses which have stood up to tests, or the elimination of those hypotheses which have not stood up to them, and which are therefore rejected. So here's Karl Popper's falsificationism. He offers this idea. 
that any hypothesis H is strongly falsifiable if it deductively implies at least one observation statement O, where an observation statement is one whose truth or falsehood can be checked by direct observation. For example, all swans are white, or Earth moves around the sun, or Brittany is pregnant. Given the problem of induction, it isn't possible to show some hypotheses are true from limited data and observations. But it is possible to show that some hypotheses are false when refuting or disconfirming evidence occurs. Popper says astrology, the Marxist theory of history, and psychoanalysis, for example, are unscientific because each is compatible with any observation. That is, nothing can refute them. See the discussion on pages 12 through 16 in the Okasha text. Up until Dutch explorers in the 1690s discovered black swans in Australia, people believed all swans are white and no swans are black. Subsequent observations falsified these claims. Popper thought that every genuine scientific hypothesis forbids or prohibits particular events or observations. Here's how to refute a falsifiable hypothesis using observations. In this example, your hypothesis is that all swans are white. But suppose you observe a swan that is not white, a swan that's black. Using deductive logic, we may reject a hypothesis because it makes a false prediction. If we observe a black swan, then the claim that all swans are white is falsified or shown to be false using Modus Tollens reasoning. I discussed Modus Tollens reasoning in an earlier lecture. So it looks like this. If H, then O. That is, if the hypothesis is true, then you would expect to see your swan is white. But in fact, this one we observe, this one we observe is an exception. It's not white. And so we have to conclude that all swans are white is false. It's not the case that all swans are white. Falsifiable doesn't mean false. Scientific statements cannot be compatible with all possible observations. A claim needs to rule out something observable if it is to say anything useful. Confirmation does not count for much. If we are uncritical, we shall always find what we want. We shall look for and find confirmations, and we shall look away from and not see whatever might be dangerous to our pet theories. We don't prove a theory. At best, we disprove it. Unlike Ayer, Popper is more concerned with whether a claim is scientific than whether it is meaningful, since lots of meaningful claims are not scientific. So a scientific claim must be testable. It should have empirical consequences. It should imply what we should and should not see, where some conceivable observation would cause us to reject it. It's important to realize the consequences of Popper's view. They are these. All tests can be interpreted as attempts to weed out false theories. Only if we cannot falsify them in spite of our best efforts can we say that they, the theories, have stood up to severe tests. Well, what has happened now that we've incorporated positivism into the history of science, into scientific reasoning? We've moved from thinking, why believe anything unless you can prove it, to now thinking, why believe anything unless you can disprove it? So the ability to be refuted or disconfirmed in a theory, in a hypothesis, is good. Here's why. Any theory with a false implication is fatally flawed. That is, any theory that implies you will see something which turns out to be wrong has got a problem. Here's Albert Einstein in his Induction and Deduction in Physics from 1919. Any theory can thus be recognized as erroneous if there is a logical error in its deductions, or as inadequate if a fact is not in agreement with its consequences. But the truth of a theory can never be proven, for one never knows that even in the future no experience will be encountered which contradicts its consequences. And still, other systems of thought are always conceivable, which are capable of joining together the same given facts. The scientific theorist is not to be envied, for nature, or more precisely experiment, is an inexorable and not very friendly judge of his work. It never says yes to a theory. In the most favorable cases, it says maybe. And in the great majority of cases, simply no. 
If an experiment agrees with a theory, it means for the theory, maybe. And if it does not agree, it means no. Probably every theory will someday experience its no, most theories soon after conception. The general theory of relativity, GTR, is the geometric theory of gravitation published by Albert Einstein in 1915. It is the current best description of gravity in modern physics. Einstein's general theory of relativity suggests that the sun's gravity bends the path of light from distant stars. It's a testable prediction, but only during a total solar eclipse. The eclipse of 1919 fit the bill nicely. By measuring the positions of stars during the eclipse and comparing them to their positions at night, when the sun is not in the field of view, it is possible to determine whether their light rays bend while passing close to the sun. Einstein's claims are testable because they are verifiable and falsifiable. He hypothesized that gravity bends space-time, producing a cosmic lens that magnifies stuff behind it. He predicted that light from stars bends around massive objects such as galaxies. Eddington and others observed the predicted amount of deflection of starlight in 1919 during a total eclipse. If Einstein were wrong, we would not observe light from stars bending as it passes stars or galaxies. Light bends around a massive object from a distant source. The orange arrows in this image show the apparent position of the background source. The white arrows show the path of the light from the true position of the source. Einstein's general theory of relativity predicted this. During a total solar eclipse in 1919 and later in 1937, stars visible during the blackout appeared in the wrong place. Stars moved by exactly the same amount general relativity predicted. This was the first experimental evidence for general relativity, which predicts that gravity from massive objects deflects light. Here's an image of a gravitational lens. It distorts the light from a much more distant galaxy. So here are some claims that are untestable according to positivists, since no observations support them and none can show they are false. The absolute enters into, but is itself incapable of, evolution and progress. A person is an immortal spiritual being, for example, souls, thetans, who possess a mind and a body. Thetans have lived through many past lives and will continue to live beyond the death of the body. Jesus of Nazareth was the son of a virgin and God, worked miracles, died, and resurrected. So this is the deal breaker for positivists. If no empirical evidence, no observations, controlled observations, can count against a claim, then that claim isn't scientific. Just let it go. The safe landing of disabled U.S. Airways Flight 1549 on the Hudson River in January of 2009 was a miracle, since no pilot could have done such a thing without God's help, people say. But really? Even a former fighter pilot who trained for water landings? Notice how miracle stories make untestable claims and overlook alternative explanations by underestimating the role of chance factors and human skill. Maybe God was involved, maybe not. There are no controlled observations of such interventions, just conjecture based on how hard it is to imagine otherwise. What can be asserted without proof can be dismissed without proof. Astrophysicist Carl Sagan thought that science is the fine art of baloney detection. Spin more than one hypothesis. If there's something to be explained, think of all the different ways in which it could be explained. Then think of tests by which you might systematically disprove each of the alternatives. What survives? The hypothesis that resists disproof in this Darwinian selection among multiple working hypotheses has a much better chance of being the right answer than if you had simply run with the first idea that caught your fancy. Doing science requires framing precise hypotheses subject to disproof. A knowledge-seeking process is scientific, then, only if it proposes and tests theories that describe or explain phenomena. Okay, here are Popper's conclusions. 
I've listed these also uh, in handout three. The idea is that scientific knowledge is conjectural, testable. It's easy to obtain confirmations or verifications for nearly every theory. If we look for them, we can find them. But confirmations should count only if they are the result of risky predictions. Every good scientific theory is also a prohibition. It forbids certain things to happen. A theory which is not refutable by any conceivable event is non-scientific. Every genuine test of a theory is an attempt to falsify it or to refute it. Some genuinely testable theories, when found to be false, are still upheld by their admirers. They can add assumptions so as to reinterpret the theory and save it from refutation. Here's a summary of Ayer versus Popper. For Popper, Ayer's method of verification only shows that an observation is consistent with a hypothesis, never that the hypothesis is true. Observations are also compatible with rivals or opposing hypotheses. Observations then support multiple different stories. We need a way to rule them out, and he offers falsification. In 1967, Roger Patterson and Robert Gimlin captured this image on video near Bluff Creek, Del Norte County, California. Is this real? The claim Bigfoot or the Sasquatch does not exist is not falsifiable, since we can't look everywhere, which we would need to do to show it's false. But it would be verifiable if we could catch one. Gorillas were not described by scientists until 1847. Mountain gorillas not until 1902, so it's possible another large primate exists. Still, we would need a physical body. In short, an unfalsifiable claim is one that cannot be tested, and any good theory should minimize its reliance on these. A description is unfalsifiable when there is no conceivable experience which could disprove it. Consider the claim, Bigfoot exists. How could you disprove that? You'd have to look everywhere, at every time, and you can't do this. A prediction is unfalsifiable when it is so broad or so ambiguous that what is claimed occurs no matter what happens. The world will end soon. When is soon? Is there any way we could show this is false? Soon is hopelessly vague. An explanation is unfalsifiable when it is consistent with any or every observation that one makes. Here's a theory. It explains why we can't catch or get good evidence of Bigfoot. Bigfoot eludes us because it is an undiscovered kind of forest ape that is smart and wants to avoid capture. That's a nice theory. It explains why we can't catch Bigfoot, but is there any way to show it's false? There isn't. It's an unfalsifiable theory. Testable or not. The Shroud of Turin is in the Cathedral of St. John the Baptist in Turin, Italy. Is this the first century linen burial cloth of Jesus or a 13th century fraud? Can any observation show it is not Jesus? So the claim that it is Jesus depicted in the shroud is not falsifiable because it's not testable. Okay, what do I mean by saying it's not testable? I mean, it looks like Jesus, right? Well, wait a minute. How do we know what Jesus looks like? This could be anybody. Well, what about people who have taken bits of the cloth and figured out how old the cloth is. Well, when they do that, it turns out this cloth is from the 1200s. Does that refute the claim that this is the burial shroud of Jesus? Well, it seems like it would, except that people say, well, they took the sample from a piece of the cloth, which was a repair. Okay, well, can we take a sample from part of the image of Jesus on the shroud? No, the church won't let us. So, in effect, Right now, no observations can disprove the theory. Certainly, what we see is consistent with it being Jesus' burial shroud, but that's not enough. It's also consistent with it being somebody else or a fraud, etc. Again, this is a deal breaker. If no empirical evidence can count against the claim, then that claim isn't scientific. Carl Sagan again here says, In science, it often happens that scientists say, 
you know, that's a really good argument. My position is mistaken. And then they would actually change their minds, and you never hear that old view from them again. They really do it. It doesn't happen as often as it should because scientists are human and change is sometimes painful. But it happens every day. I can't recall the last time something like that happened in politics or religion. To be clear, what is the exact difference between verifiability and falsifiability? Both are kinds of testability. For verification, a claim needs to be confirmable or corroborated by observations. Sensory experiences under controlled conditions support it or are consistent with it. This is not proof. For falsification, a claim needs to be refutable or disconfirmable by observations. Its truth should be incompatible with some experiences' predictions. Again, this does not prove something's true. Notice, we define these terms without relying upon the terms verify or falsify. That would be circular. We don't say a claim is verifiable just in case you are able to verify it by experience. We say that some experience or other is consistent with it. Some observations under controlled conditions support it. Here's a matrix of testables, and I'm offering here some guidelines. I'm going to go through this briefly here, but we're going to have an exercise in a class discussion about this. We can divide claims or propositions into either of two categories, verifiable or falsifiable. This means that a claim theoretically could be verifiable and falsifiable, not verifiable and falsifiable, not falsifiable but verifiable, or not verifiable and not falsifiable. For instance, the claim Brittany is pregnant is both verifiable and falsifiable. We could do a pregnancy test, a blood test, for instance, and establish that, in fact, she's pregnant. That same test would show that she is not. So it's both verifiable and falsifiable. What about a claim that is falsifiable but not verifiable? Here's an example. All pit bulls are vicious. You could show that's false by presenting a pit bull that was not vicious. You can't verify it, though. How would you verify that claim? How would you prove that's true? You'd have to look at all the pit bulls everywhere, every when. Can't do it. What about a claim that's verifiable but not falsifiable? Suppose someone says, some, P-R-Q, sometimes looks matter. Okay, that's verifiable because we know people care about looks. Some people, not necessarily all people. Could you show it's false? People say, if someone says, looks matter sometimes, how could you prove that that's false? You, again, you'd have to have every circumstance where someone's looking at someone else, how they look. You can't prove it's false. There are also claims which are neither verifiable nor falsifiable, and these would not be scientific claims for positivists. Suppose someone says something like, terrorism never works. You might believe that. It's not true or false because of the meaning of terrorism, whatever that is. The idea here is that, how do you show terrorism never works? It certainly seems to. It seems to motivate people to do things, to hurt other people in order to overthrow a political regime. But we have to be clear on what we mean by terrorism, and we're not clear on that. And to say it never works? Do you mean always, forever, never? Because, again, that's something we can't establish. There's no way to show that's false. Again, there's also no way to show it's true. How do you show it never is the case that it works? The future is wide open, and perhaps we could say 9-11 was an instance of when terrorism actually worked to turn the world against, much of the world against, the United States. But there are claims which are true, regardless of whether they are verifiable or falsifiable. For instance, mathematical claims, geometrical claims, claims about things that are true by definition, for instance, bachelors are unmarried. That is not something that we could falsify by any observation. If we found some bachelor who was married, they wouldn't be a bachelor, because it's a contradiction in terms to say that a bachelor is married. Is it verifiable or not? It's not verifiable. It's not something you can prove by experience. It's something that's true in virtue of the meaning of what it is to be a bachelor. If you're a bachelor, that implies you're an unmarried adult male human. Wherever you go, there you are. That's always true, regardless of whether you can or cannot test it by observations. It's just redundant. So here is a test of your understanding for each of these claims. I want to know whether they're testable in either the verifiable or falsifiable sense. 
Let's look at the answers here. Brittany is pregnant is verifiable and falsifiable. We can do a test to rule out the possibility of pregnancy. At the same time, that test and subsequent tests can demonstrate pregnancy. Suppose somebody says money does not buy happiness. Is that verifiable? Can I prove money doesn't buy happiness? Well, sometimes it doesn't. Do you mean it never does? Because to say it never does, that's something I can't check. Is it falsifiable that money does not buy happiness? It is falsifiable because all you need is someone who's happy because they have money or they use money. It makes them happy. Recall the Einstein case. The sun's gravity deflects light from other stars. Remember, he predicted this on his theory of general relativity. This was a prediction which people did not expect to see. They thought this was a mistake. In fact, if they didn't observe light from far stars deflecting during an eclipse, they would have said Einstein's theory was wrong. Einstein's theory ran the risk of being wrong. It would have been refuted, falsified, if his prediction was false, namely if we did not observe if the light did not deflect from distant stars. This one is actually verifiable and falsifiable. What about the claim rattlesnake bites are not usually lethal? I'm going to say this is not verifiable. Here's why. You have to see the results of every, or at least virtually every, rattlesnake bite to say it's not usually lethal. So you can't verify that. Can I falsify that? Again, same problem. You'd have to see the outcome of all of the bites, or most all of the bites, to be able to get close to saying that's not true or that's not probably true. So here the issue is it's not doable, it's not testable. Again, in determining whether claims are testable or not, use this diagram. Well, what makes claims untestable? Here are the top three reasons why a claim is either not verifiable or not falsifiable, which means not testable. Remoteness of relevant data. Too few observables under controlled conditions. So here we have an issue with any sort of historical claim, any sort of religious claim. We don't have controlled observations. We don't have access. There aren't living witnesses we can cross-examine with respect to miracles happening. Second problem, vagueness of terms, ambiguous statements. Even in the case of the rattlesnake bite, we have to get clear on what it means to say usually, mostly in uh, cases where people are actually envenomated or when they are actually hospitalized. So the vagueness of terms makes things difficult. Terrorism was an ex example of this. Unless you're really clear about what you mean, it's hard to demonstrate that terrorism never works. Finally, inconceivability of a test. That is, you can't think of a test that permits you to reject the null hypothesis, either due to insufficient evidence or added hypotheses that protect the claim from being falsified. The, pretty much lots of religious stories are this way where people add in alternative interpretations or remind us that what they're asserting is possible when they begin by trying to tell us that it's actually the case, for instance, that Jesus of Nazareth resurrected or did miracles. Here is a quick and dirty summary of the relation between scientific claims and their testability. If a hypothesis is scientific, then it's testable. A hypothesis is testable only if it is either verifiable or falsifiable. So if a hypothesis is scientific, it's going to be either verifiable or falsifiable. Thus, if a hypothesis isn't either verifiable or falsifiable, then it is not scientific. Deductive logic demonstrates that some immediate inferences are derivable from necessary relations between four types of propositions. I talked about this when I discussed deduction. This relation also helps us assess testability. A and E claims are falsifiable, but not verifiable. I and O claims are verifiable, but not falsifiable. To say that every S is P is falsified just in case some S is not a P. You can't verify that because it's in every claim. It's a claim about everything, every S that is. Of every S we say it's P. In short, too often you can't verify most universal claims, most general claims. And you can't falsify particular claims, specific claims. Claims, for instance, about something existing or not existing.
Positivists say good. Non-positivists say this is not so good. There are limits on falsification. I want you to look at handout 3, section 5, 7, where I summarize some of these. In short, it turns out we can falsify some scientific claims, but not others. And the view of falsification we begin with is somewhat naive in that it's either too strict or too vague. Much of what we normally take to be science turns out to be unfalsifiable. And also, almost anything counts as science when you connect it up with some testable hypotheses. So Popper's falsificationist criterion as a means of distinguishing science from non-science is simplistic. False predictions don't kill a theory. Instead, observations not predicted by a theory only reveal its flaws. We could, instead of rejecting the theory, revise it. Still, it's very useful to use the falsificationist criterion. It's not good enough. It's not sufficient for calling something science. But put that to one side. A prediction that turns out to be false should count against any hypothesis that predicts it. So this is why it's necessary when we assess theories that we look for those we can test, those that are falsifiable. We saw that the verificationist theory of meaning is useful in science, but it has limits because some statements are neither verifiable nor falsifiable on their own. But they could be meaningful, contrary to Alfred Ayer. Humans evolve from apes, or natural selection produces new species, are meaningful only in the context of other assumptions. When each term is defined and risky observable consequences specified, you actually can test those claims. Here's a useful criterion, not a perfect one for drawing a line between science and non-science if you need it. If a hypothesis is scientific, then it's testable, that is, either verifiable or falsifiable, by some conceivable observation. But this necessary feature, testability, isn't sufficient. Insofar as a scientific statement speaks about reality, it must be falsifiable. And insofar as it is not falsifiable, it does not speak about reality. Next, does science describe reality? Read Chapter 4 in the Okasha text, Realism and Anti-Realism. Read also Handout 4 on What Do Scientific Theories Do? This is the end of the slideshow.